Hello from Clio Cloud Conference 2017 in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm Christine Bilbury from the Florida Bar. And I'm Jonathan Israel from the Florida Bar. And I'm Joshua Lennon, lawyer in residence at Clio. And we're on the road with Legal Talk Network. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on the road. It's a pleasure to be here at the Big Easy, and today we're talking about Bitcoins and blockchains with Joshua Lennon. Hi, thanks for having me. So Joshua, tell us what you do at Clio um, and a little bit about yourself. Sure, so I am one of the few Americans working for the Canadian company Clio. So I'm a New York licensed attorney and I serve as lawyer in residence at Clio. And so it's a position that focuses on legal scholarship and research into how lawyers work and a lot of their compliance needs. And that spans a whole different variety of areas, whether it's technology or privacy, or in this instance, we're taking a look at financial transactions and how lawyers might need to know certain compliance issues as it relates to cryptocurrencies. And so accepting Bitcoins, I think, is a scary proposition for a lot of attorneys mm -hmm. um, because it's been associated with uh, the Silk Road drug trade and those kind of things. But I know nowadays there are some very legitimate companies. Um, so can you tell us some of the, the major companies that are now accepting Bitcoin? Sure. So almost all the major corporations that do like merchant services are accepting Bitcoin right now. So Dell and Microsoft, for example, will accept Bitcoin for software and computers. We know that Starbucks will allow you to buy a cup of coffee using a Bitcoin. And we've even seen uh, industries like fast food chains start to create their own cryptocurrencies. Like Burger King has created their own Whopper token in Russia. <laughs> and you can buy a Whopper in Russia using a Whopper Bitcoin analog. So it's kind of crazy how fast these are being adopted just as a part of everyday financial transactions. And so, you know, obviously these are major corporations that have the resources to go and, and handle these types of payments, uh, you know, receiving these types mm -hmm. of payments. I'm just a solo attorney. I want to try and offer this to my clients. What are some of the steps I need to take to be able to accept Bitcoins? Well, that's the great thing about Bitcoin technology and other cryptocurrencies is they're not very heavy in investment at all to be able to use them. So if you're a lawyer who's interested in accepting bitcoins as a payment or any other type of cryptocurrency there are really only two or three things you need you need to sign up for what's called a wallet and that's a place where you can store the address associated with the digital asset that is the cryptocurrency you need to have the ability to transfer the cryptocurrency back into fiat cash or the normal cash that we carry in our pocket and you have to be able to just kind of inform your client on what you're doing uh, once you do those, you have the technical background to be able to accept Bitcoins. There are probably some ethical duties you'll need to add on top of that. And Bitcoin is actually um, kind of the front side of what's known as a blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly tell our listeners what blockchain is? Sure. So a lot of traditional online computing services right now rely on somebody sitting at the middle of it. So it might be Google that's passing the email back and forth to people. Or if you're processing your credit card at a Target, it'll be Visa or MasterCard or American Express that's sitting in the middle and processing that transaction for you. So what the blockchain does is it uses a series of code and storage to remove that person in the middle. And so all it does is you have a bunch of people who kind of voluntarily run a node. This is where I get highly technical. And what the node does is it looks for transactions on that particular blockchain. It bundles them all together in a block and then it chains them to a series of existing transactions. And as things go out to the nodes and become part of the chain, then they're just part of the permanent record. And anybody hosting that blockchain or processing that blockchain is helping maintain that record. So it takes out the middleman and allows for these transactions, a distributed ledger as it will, to exist without a middleman and be pretty much impervious to alteration because it is being hosted in so many different locations. Uh, so there's a lot of technical aspects to it, but that's basically how a blockchain works. 
And I know that you um, mentioned, we just watched your presentation here at Clio Cloud Conference. Thank you. Um, and you talked about, so someone wants to pay me in Bitcoin and I have no idea what's a Bitcoin worth. And so you told us how we can actually check and get a quote on the current price of Bitcoin. What does That's somebody do? That's absolutely true. So the New York Stock Exchange actually maintains a Bitcoin index. So they're tracking that particular cryptocurrency. And they'll tell you what they believe the current valuation of a Bitcoin is. And that's actually really great if you're a lawyer looking at Bitcoins as an asset, because not only will it allow you to figure out, oh, this is worth about $3,000 of my time, but you can also, if the, you're handling cases where Bitcoin is in dispute, look at the value today, but also maybe the value three years ago when it first started changing hands. So the New York Stock Exchange uh, Bitcoin Index is actually a very handy place to research that. There are lots of other cryptocurrencies, so you may have to look at different exchanges for those. Coinbase.com is actually a very popular one as well for looking at um, other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum or Litecoin or the vast variety of others that are springing up right now. I think there's sort of a social proof element to a lot of this um, new adaptation of a technology. And when we were in the room, you asked the, the whole room full of attendees, how many of you are currently accepting Bitcoin? I think two people raised their hand. Two lawyers out of uh, about, what, 50 in the room? Right. No. But like at Clio, do you have any kind of idea? Like, are there thousands of attorneys out there accepting Bitcoin? Do you have any kind of idea of numbers? So right now we don't. Now... That doesn't mean that they aren't. It's just that we don't have that insight into their accounts. So they could be accepting a, a Bitcoin and tracking a Bitcoin in their accounting system in Clio. We just wouldn't know it. So uh, because of the separation we have between our customers' data and our own functionality. And then during the presentation, you also talked about how the blockchain extends beyond cryptocurrencies and the other uses that we see the blockchain coming for. Um, can you expand on those a little bit? Oh, absolutely. So blockchain isn't just a means of tracking value, like the exchange of Bitcoins, but also of creating an unalterable record. So anything where you would want an unalterable record, whether it's, say, a contract negotiation or contract performance, that's actually a really exciting use for blockchain. And we're also starting to see it as a form of record keeping by agencies. So the Illinois, uh, Illinois as a state is now going to put birth certificates out on a blockchain. And so you'll be able to authenticate at least your place of birth by looking at a particular blockchain entry and tracking that. It will be unalterable for the rest of your life. You were born in you know, Springfield, Illinois. Done. Uh, we're seeing Delaware start to track different types of stock being issued right now, starting in August of 2017. And we know that courts in both Arizona and in Vermont are taking a look at blockchain as a means of authenticating documents in their evidentiary chains. So there are lots of different ways to use blockchain technology that aren't about specifically tracking value, but more about tracking authenticity. A totally different approach to, uh, that you brought up, but, you know, you're accepting Bitcoin in your, in your firm, but the flip side of that is you may have a divorce client and you find out that the uh, other spouse is hiding assets in Bitcoin. Uh, what do you tell attorneys about that? So what's I think comforting about my session is a lot of the, the steps that you go to to take a look at assets that are being kind of removed from the marriage are, are basically the same for Bitcoin. You're looking for suspicious transactions, you're looking for bank records, you're looking for unusual purchases, uh, and then you're diving deeper into those. So just because somebody is trying to hide money in Bitcoin doesn't mean that you're changing your workflow. You're just asking a couple more questions. Like, I see you withdrew $10,000. Where is that $10,000 going? Uh, and there are a couple of things that I did advise. So don't focus on any particular cryptocurrency. Like Bitcoin is very popular, but there are a lot more that are coming online right now. There are at least 900 that are being tracked right now. So don't limit your discovery and your interrogatories to any particular digital asset, but instead ask really broad questions. Look for the answers like, do you have any digital assets? What type of digital assets do you have? Are you in possession of any cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Litecoin or Ethereum? 
such that you can then really start to drive down once they give you some specific answers. Once they give you those answers, then you can look at the, the details that are specific to something like a Bitcoin, like what is its address? Where is the wallet, the digital wallet that you're holding it? Um, does anyone else have access to it as a signator? Those are the type of things that you can ask specifically about it, but just at the get-go, you're doing the exact same type of forensic research that you would in any other divorce case. And, but what are the courts saying about Bitcoin? Is it money? What are the federal agencies uh, so saying about it? So what's really interesting is uh, most courts are treating Bitcoin as, quote, not money, unquote. So they'll tell you that you can buy goods and services with it, you can exchange it for other currencies, you can do things with it like you could do with any other dollar in your pocket. But because it doesn't have necessarily the backing of an institution like the US Federal uh, Fed or the Treasury Department, it's not what they call a fiat currency and therefore is not traditional money under most legal rulings. In fact, the IRS has come out and said that it's treated as property for tax purposes. The bankruptcy courts are treating it as property or an asset rather than currency, and that means it can have uh, fluctuating valuations attached to it. Whereas in bankruptcy, a dollar is a dollar. In, uh, with Bitcoin in bankruptcy, the value could fluctuate depending on when you purchased it and what's the market value now, just like any other type of physical asset. So courts are definitely not treating Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies as a currency, but more like a stock certificate or any other asset where you can park value, but that value can fluctuate. So I'm an attorney and I've decided to go ahead and start accepting cryptocurrencies, obviously mm -hmm. Bitcoin being the first, but you mentioned that there's, I think you said over 900, of 900 them other cryptocurrencies right now. How do I know which ones I want to accept, which ones I don't want to accept? How do you, you know, how do you stay up to date and know, okay, this one I probably shouldn't touch? So it depends on, on how you're going to use the cryptocurrency. So the Nebraska ethics regulator actually put out an opinion just about two weeks ago on some guidance on how attorneys should be using cryptocurrency. So say you want to accept cryptocurrencies as a payment of fees. One of the things that they were most worried about is protecting both the client and the lawyer at the same time. You don't want to be paid with something that either dramatically drops in value and leaves your law firm kind of holding the bag or dramatically rises in value and might be unfair to your client. So their recommendation was, if you're gonna be paid in a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, is to immediately transfer it back into normal cash. So in choosing what you're gonna accept, take a look at, is there a licensed exchange where you can legally transfer that money? And one of the ones recommended by Nebraska was Coinbase.com. Now they're not gonna handle all 900 cryptocurrencies out there. So if somebody wants to tra uh, pay you in a made up cryptocurrency like Meowcoin, and I made that up, but there may actually be one, uh, and you can't actually turn that back into US dollars, don't accept it, right? But if they wanna pay you in something uh, it has a good exchange rate, it lines up with the values of your services, it's not unconscionable to the client, and you can find a licensed exchange to handle that transfer back into, into hard currency, yeah, go ahead and accept it. It should be perfectly fine. And if I have a reputable uh, wallet to mm -hmm. accept it, will they be able to give me some guidance on which cryptocurrencies? Will they only uh, accept certain cryptocurrencies? So they'll probably only accept certain cryptocurrencies. Uh, and that's part of because there are different blockchains out there. And every time a new cryptocurrency spins up, it may have kind of a little bit of a different blockchain behind it. Maybe it's a private blockchain where only certain people can participate and that might keep an, ex uh, an exchange out. Or maybe it doesn't really have a user base yet. And so there isn't a lot of value parked in it. You can't really weigh what it actually is worth. So there are lots of different reasons why an exchange might not accept or trade a cryptocurrency from cash or vice versa. And so you just do have to be kind of mindful on what's available and what's legal and accept that. But the research into it's actually very easy. 
And because we're talking about attorneys, I know that you mentioned in your presentation that there is um, there's a certain amount of due diligence that they should be doing when it, when someone approaches them and wants to pay them in a cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the due diligence? Well, absolutely. So one of the worries when it comes to cryptocurrencies is there are a lot of people who assume it's completely anonymous. It's not, but they feel like they can kind of get away with something. Maybe they're avoiding taxes or maybe they're shifting money from a foreign jurisdiction without declaring it. Uh, this is really unlikely to be perfectly honest. Uh, but it is a concern just as if you would be accepting any other kind of fungible property asset like a diamond, right? Where did they get that diamond? So I, the Nebraska guidance did recommend, especially in the cases where you're accepting payment for a client from a third party. So say it's like a, an aunt or a business partner or somebody like that who's covering your client's legal fees to definitely go ahead and do your due diligence on their relationship the source of the funds? Is it in any way like seeming like they're trying to hide something? A lot of it's a little bit of a gut check, but the American Bar Association has actually issued some good guidance on anti-money laundering best practices. It's really just kind of a, it's a really long white paper with a really short checklist. So when you, when you download it for free, don't, don't freak out when you read it. Uh, that give you just some simple checklist type stuff to ask your client or maybe ask the third party paying before you really take them on and start accepting that type of payment. But it's the exact same questions you would ask any third party that was stepping in to help out your client. So before we close it out today, I have one last question for you. If our listeners would like to follow up, how can they reach you or find out more information about this sure. topic? So I, I do want to highlight my partner in the presentation, Amy Terhar, who's with Integra Ledger was actually really crucial in helping educate me in this issue. And she's part of the Global Legal Blockchain Consortium, uh, which is something that I think every lawyer should take a look at. They're starting kind of a new blockchain platform for legal use. So smart contracts, maybe we come up with our own legal currency uh, that your clients can use to pay you. There are all kinds of ways that this can be used. So I want to highlight her, and she can be found on Twitter at Amy Terhar, T E R H double a r and you can reach me on twitter as well so joshua lennon at joshua lennon or email me at joshua cleo i'm always happy to connect with everybody and i have an open profile on linkedin so that's another great way to connect with me and let's continue the conversation on how bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are something that you will encounter in the practice of law Excellent. Thank you. That's been very helpful to our listeners. So I want to thank Joshua Lennon for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And we also want to thank our listeners for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please rate us an Apple podcast. We'll see you next time for another episode of On the Road with Legal Talk Network. I'm Christine Bilbrey. And I'm Jonathan Israel. And I'm Joshua Lennon. <laughs> Until next time. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. Or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Yeah.